You are listening to the Get Global Podcast, a weekly journey into the international business landscape with leaders, knowers, and doers from around the world who share their stories and insights on the issues that matter most. Get Global brings you the best to help you thrive in foreign markets. So today we have with us Marcus Broccoli. Uh, he was, he's now the managing partner at North Base Media, uh, which is a uh, venture fund focused on uh, uh, media and technology in emerging markets. Uh, but before this, he was the executive editor at the Washington Post, and before that, the managing editor of the Wall Street Journal. He's worked in Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Tokyo, and Colorado, and New York. Uh, so I'll, uh, so Marcus, thanks for being with us. Great to be with you. And um, tell us a little bit more about you, uh, what got you into this, uh, the kinds of opportunities that you're seeing in the world today, and what's, what's interesting to you. Well, first, thanks. thank you very much for having me on. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I spent 30 years in established media. The last six years, I was editor first of the Wall Street Journal, and then after that, uh, when Rupert Murdoch's News Corp acquired the journal's parent company, I, I left and became editor of the Washington Post. And for much of my career as a journalist, I'd worked overseas, mostly in Asia. And during the time I worked there, which was in the 80s and 90s, it was a time of tremendous upheaval and economic acceleration. I think I got accustomed to seeing change as normal, to seeing disruption as a positive force. The opportunities from technology, the inclusion of hundreds of millions of new consumers in the economy were were incredible, really, from an observer's point of view. And so when in, in 2012, I stepped down as editor of the Washington Post, I had a pretty clear idea of what I wanted to do in the next stage of my career. And that was to work with the entrepreneurs and visionaries who were going to create the next generation of media companies for the hundreds of millions and billions of people who were just getting access to the internet. And I had, during the year after I stepped down at the Washington Post, I worked for Graham Holdings, which was then the parent company of the Washington Post, although they then sold it to, to Jeff Bezos. And during that year, I, I gotten to know uh, and, and eventually partnered with a brilliant one-time entrepreneur and longtime media investor from Europe named Sasha Lucinich. And Sasha had long ago in the distant sands of time, he'd started a media company in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, where he was come, where he was from, which became the leading media company in Yugoslavia, but not before there was a war and he had to leave the country. He had then gone to work with uh, to starting a fund, the first venture, the first impact fund in Europe, focused on fostering independent media in post-communist Europe. Then he'd moved to Asia and he'd done the same thing there. And his his fund called the Media Development Loan Fund, which is now the Media Development Investment Fund, was sort of the leading international investor in media. But with the condition that they were often investing in media companies in politically challenged environments. Sasha and I got to talking. We both sort of had a similar idea of what was going on in the world that we wanted to take advantage of. And that epiphany was hit me, actually, when I was back in China, where I had lived for a long time. And long ago, when I was living in, in Shanghai, um, I and a, the Reuters bureau chief and another friend had started a co-founded a nightclub. <laughs> and the nightclub, um, we had a, a few other friends who invested and it became very trendy in, in Shanghai and it actually sort of exposed me to the, the fun of being involved in creating something in business. But some of the people who invested in that nightclub back in the late 1990s went on to start media companies in China and they were enormously successful. And I had this epiphany, which was, you know, I've been spending the last you know 10 years of my life knocking my head against the wall, running a big, running big legacy newsrooms but big legacy media companies um, in a saturated market. And if you think about it, if you're in a saturated market and you're the establishment player, particularly in a sort of oligopolistic or monopolistic position, and there's a technology that enables disruption, your market share is only going one way and it's down. And that was what you know we were defending against. And even to start a successful digital media company and compete with those legacy media companies in this market is harder because the legacy media companies will burn bonfires of cash to defend their position. And so the investors in, in startup media companies have to expend huge amounts of money and they, they lose money for a lot longer. My thought and Sasha's thought was if you go to a market like China, which I'd known you know, back in the 90s when the primary form of media consumption was pirate DVDs, the growth of 
access to internet and mobile technologies resulted in this incredible sort of near vertical demand curve for new media. And what we realized is that China was sort of this great, you know, petri dish test test market because the central government in China was able to say, okay, let's give 600 million people smartphones and 900 million people access to broadband internet. And in most countries, it wasn't going to happen that fast. And indeed, it hadn't happened. So our theory was we would find media companies and smart entrepreneurs in markets where that growth curve was just beginning to take off, where people were just beginning to get access to digital media and to, or to, sorry, to smartphones and, and, and broadband. So he and I started uh, North Base Media in the beginning of 20, 2014. And we started making seed investments. Um, we actually strayed from our thesis at the beginning a little bit. We, our first investment was actually in Taiwan, which is not sort of the, the model market for us. But the markets that we care a lot about now are, you know, big population places with fast growing access to broadband and internet, large young populations, and ideally no government impediments to foreign investment. So Indonesia, uh, India, Middle East, Mexico, we see, we see a lot of opportunity in those places. So what are, now, now that you've been at this for a while, uh, what are the things that you've learned along the way? Obviously, you've spent time in these markets, you're familiar with them, you know that they're different, but <clears throat> going in and doing due diligence and you know, competitor mapping and, and really thinking hard about uh, things from their perspective, what has been the most interesting thing that you've learned along the way or set of things that you've learned along the way? So I think um, anytime you, you switch careers, uh, there's going to be a lot of learning, and it, it, it's you have to you have to sh you have to be prepared to show a lot of humility as you as you make mistakes along the way. And I think I've learned every I've learned all kinds of things, including a lot of very prosaic things that now seem blindingly obvious to me. But at the time I learned them was the result of some mistake I made. You know, ranging from you know how do you how do you raise money um, to where where should your where should your fund be based? Because it makes a difference both to the investors and sometimes to the people you're investing in. Um, finding companies, identifying smart entrepreneurs, doing diligence on people. Those things actually turn out to be much more, I guess, familiar in terms of the process to somebody like me who has a long experience in journalism. Because I think in journalism, you get good at identifying people who, who know things and understand things, who are smart. You get good at sort of assessing people's credibility and maybe the, it's code for credit worthiness or <laughs> worthiness as an investor investment. Um, and so all of that stuff was new to me and all of that stuff required a lot of learning as does, you know, fundraising and, and how do you manage other people's money? Um, those are things we spend a lot of time on. And I think they, we spend more time on them because we have to make sure we're doing them right because we're, in my case, learning it all. My partner, Sasha, had spent 15 years running a fund, so he's got more experience there. Um, the things that, that I think would surprise you in terms of the, the evolution of these markets is they really are almost, almost in every case a country which is just now getting access to the broadband and smartphones will behave completely differently with media than the way we in the U.S. do. And there is a, there is a presumption – a sort of uh, combined arrogant, imperialistic, you know, myopic way of seeing the world in the U.S., where the assumption is that if other people could just, you know, do things the way, just have access to the technology, they'll do things the way we do things. And that's just not at all the case. I mean, the, the most obvious example of that is China, of course, where, you know, people consume vast amounts of information over these platforms like um, like WeChat, Weixin, or Weibo, um, this microblogging site. And it's not, you know, people keep wanting it to be, they, they, they draw the connection between, you know, Facebook and this or Twitter and that. Um, a good friend of mine started this company called Yoku, which became the sort of, the, the people call it the YouTube of China, but it was really more like YouTube and Netflix and, you know, live video all balled up in one thing. And the, the reality is people who get access to technology for the first time now are going to engage with it completely differently. So I'll give you an, an example of something that, you know, the way we think here. I spent, I don't know how many hours in meetings over my career at big newspapers trying to figure out, well, how do we take the Wall Street Journal, which has this intensely loyal, you know, subscriber base, and make it 
put it on the phone so that our readers will feel comfortable with it and it'll look like the Wall Street Journal. That's and it was a legitimate business argument. Why do we how do we you know preserve that audience but just transition them over to something else and they're going to want their product to look like the product they know and love. In a lot of these places, people have no brand loyalty. They don't, you're not adapting anything for them. You're creating something out of whole cloth. And the way they engage with content may look completely different from the way we engage with content here. And so you see American media companies or Western media companies going into some of these markets and trying to become the big players because they think that, you know, people people would just love to get access to our grade A well-known US brand in that market. And I I'm again I'm familiar with this from my days running the Wall Street Journal and working at the Wall Street Journal. For years, we had the Asian Wall Street Journal, which was distributed in Asia starting in 1976. And we had the Wall Street Journal Europe, which was distribu distributed in Europe. And actually, those products worked pretty well, just as Time and Newsweek had their editions and in, their international editions in those regions. And in part, it was because, you know, they were the best quality product around. In part, it was because they, in the case of the Wall Street Journal, the information in that was the information that the biggest economy in the world, the players in the biggest economy in the world were were consuming. And so if you were somewhere down the supply chain and running factories in, in Hong Kong or China, you kind of wanted to know what your, what your clients back in the U.S. were reading. So there was, there was power in the brands that has dramatically receded and faded as digital technologies come along. And I think part of the reason for that is that in, the, in today's world, in the vast, flat digital plane, people have visibility across all regions, across all forms of content. And so if you're and you know, there was never really there was never any sort of intellectual um, monopoly. The U.S. never had any intellectual monopoly. It just happened to have the, it had the technology and it had the tools before other people did to print and distribute newspapers. And we, you know, in the, the luxury of our monopoly media markets, we had developed all the standards of journalism that became the norms. But today, you know, if if you're starting a media company in India, you can produce media, you, you can see what the best journalism or the best content being produced in the US or in Europe looks like, and you can replicate it, or you can choose to ignore it and not replicate it and come up with a completely different model. Um, people don't expect, people in a, in a regional or a national market don't necessarily favor the international brands in the way that they used to at all. In fact, over time, they're going to favor the local brands. So we have an investment in a company in Mumbai, in India, called Pocket Aces. But they travel they, they travel under the banners on social media, on, on YouTube, of Dice, which is sort of, uh, they do sort of video series, sort of sitcom-y, very lively, millennial-targeted uh, series. Or they do short, snappy, viral videos under the name Filter Copy. And when we invested there a couple of years ago, they would put up a video, maybe get 70,000 views in a day. Now they'll get a million views in a day. And a big function of that is simply more people having access to the internet through mobile broadband. But it's also their quality of their content is very high. And interestingly, last year they surpassed BuzzFeed videos and Facebook as sort of the top, the most widely shared social videos in India came from pocket aces, not from BuzzFeed. Now I'm sure when BuzzFeed went into India, BuzzFeed felt sort of chuffed as the British might say that they were you know, top of the top of the league tables, but I think inevitably the U.S. brands, which may make may make some early, get some early traction by bringing their name into those markets, they will get supplanted by domestic brands. It's like in China, you know, Facebook is not allowed in China. China has the Great Firewall. It's not as if people in China don't have access to information. There are restrictions clearly on what they can see from outside, and those are serious issues. But the reality is, it's a vibrant, deep media market, and People in China who use Weixin, use WeChat, they're not sitting around hankering for Facebook. And yet, you know, you see Mark Zuckerberg going to China on several occasions, trying to woo the Chinese and get access to the market. And, you know, if he did get access to that market, by the way, he'd have to make some compromises, I think, in terms of, you know, information that could, what kind of information could travel where. And, you know, there'd be, I think he'd face a lot of backlash in the West for the compromises he'd have to make. But second of all, I don't think that the people of China are sitting around aching for Facebook. They have incredibly good domestically produced platform that they, that's highly engaging and allows them to do everything from shop to make payments to they're just they're not waiting around for Facebook, which in, by some measures is a sort of antiquated version of what they're what they're doing. 
And the same thing is going to be true in India. India is going to develop its own brands. Um, and it's going to be true even in you know, a country like Indonesia, which is 250 million people, where we have a, a very interesting investment in a digital media company there. And people will start in those markets keying off of Western ideas. They'll sort of see what works in the West, but they'll very quickly veer off and pursue ideas and solutions and platforms that appeal to the audience that they have. And the audience they have doesn't have any expectations of it being anything like what's in the West. What are some examples where uh, they're solving or, or catering to local, solving local problems or catering to local interests that uh, stand out to you as, as worthy of, of really considering if you are a, a foreign brand? Because BuzzFeed went in there and hired a bunch of uh, mm. qualified Indian people to handle that and they've started up their own niche brands, um, also aimed at millennials like, oh my God, yeah, OMG. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's like some really interesting things going on there in that domain. Um, what is the secret sauce? What are they doing in those smaller companies that um, that really gets under people's skin in such a way that they feel like they just have to share it? And, and I'll ask you about how they do share it. So uh, let me explain like this. I think if if you can imagine, so we're sitting here in the U.S. and you and I are probably you know closely familiar with lots of different U.S. media brands, and if Tomorrow, um, the Times of India, which writes with a sort of curious Victorian English in its newspaper and writes lots of really short articles. And they use like the way they frame things is very different from the way things are written in the U.S. They don't they don't fill up the newspaper with quotes. Our journalists write a certain way. If that form of journalism, somebody if the Times of India tried to start, you know, the Times of India U.S. edition, thinking that it was going to sweep the U.S. And if that was the only product that we had available, we would. You and I would say, hey, we can do better. We can think of something that appeals more to the way people hear, think, and talk than the way that brand delivers. It's, it's Times India is a great company, brilliant. You know, they've been genius at building out the way they, the way they very aggressive way I have to say they, they built out their digital businesses in India. But they they know their market, and you know, people there will be intuition advantages that the locals will have that are going to be hard for the West or for the U.S. international media companies to just acquire. Again, you might, if, you know, at the beginning, if you were, if you were an entrepreneur and you wanted to start something in a big market and some big international brand came and said, hey, why don't you, you know, help us build out some brands in your market? Sure. I think that might work, that might work well even. Um, but you have to, the, the international brand would have to give them a lot of latitude. I don't think the brand, I don't think brands travel in nearly the same way they did before for media. I think people are going to favor indigenous local brands more than they're going to favor the international brands. And to, to reinforce that point, you know, India, but just to keep using India as an example, you know, India's got like literally hundreds, but let's say a dozen major languages of which, you know, half a dozen are really major languages, which hundreds of millions of people can speak. And the, the users of mobile phones who speak one of those languages, who, when they get on a phone for the first time and, you know, maybe can't even afford a data plan, they're prepaying data or they're using it for Wi-Fi in, in local tea houses or whatever. Those people who speak, a, a, you know, a local dialect, who speak Tamil, for example, in India, they're not looking for any Western brand. That Western brand has like just about zero value. There's no competitive advantage. Whereas if something comes along that really ha captures the, the, the culture, the way of speaking, the attitudes, the interests of that community, they're going to gravitate to it. Because again, they've never had access to media before. They get this phone and all of a sudden they have choices in media. It's like, you know, they may have had cable TV in their community, but they've never really been able to sort of choose what they want and to sort of flit around the way we, we've all become accustomed to on our phones. So I'll give you an example of, of something that we invested in that I think is a kind of a brilliant, different understanding of how media works. Um, we invested in a company called Duta, D-U-T-A. And Duta is run by a, a brilliant young entrepreneur who lives in, actually he lives in Palo Alto, but he spends a lot of time in India. His team is in India. Um, he would go back to India to see his family, and he noticed that his parents were, his family and his friends, and his, and his where, where he grew up would all be, communicating over WhatsApp, you know, and WhatsApp in this country was never the huge thing it was outside of the U.S. It was, and it was a huge thing because it was data light. And you know that in most developing markets, one of the first challenges is make your product accessible 
to people who can't afford data plans because most people don't have data plans. And the phone operators don't start by with don't start off with, you know, all you can eat data. They get there eventually. So he went back and he was in his hometown. He started thinking, well, like everybody's communicating entirely on WhatsApp. So I got to figure out how can I deliver news and information of WhatsApp? Because that's one thing they can get wherever they are. Because most of these people would, you know, when they're at home, they can get access to, or when they're at a, a you know, local community center, they can get access to the internet. But otherwise, they don't have wife, they don't have access to, to broadband. So he started this product and he relied on social media to build his to build his community because in WhatsApp, you can't broadcast out. WhatsApp doesn't let you have more than 40 people in a group or 50 people in a group, right? But as many people as want to can add you to their group. So he basically, the word would go out, if you want news about sports, about cricket, add this number to your group and cricket information will go out. And so he grew, you know, in a very viral way to where he's got several million people a day who use this. They spend on average 20 minutes a day consuming content on his product. And by the way, he's built it out in a kind of genius way where you can have, there's all kinds of information on demand and it's all over WhatsApp. And in India, there's, as in Latin America, as in Africa, there are a lot of phone operators that offer very cheap, like $1 a month WhatsApp only data plans. And so he's able to reach lots of people with what is basically in the spirit of Huffington Post, although I don't think he, he drew inspiration from them, aggregated news from other sources. So he, he'll do a quick summary of news. He'll put a link knowing that some people are looking at it in a place that they can click through. But most people, they're, they're not going to click through the link. He's just, you know, if people do click through, it's fine with him. They go off and read the original article, wherever the article comes from. Most people are just using it to get, get a quick summary of the news or find out sports scores. He does real-time, you know, sports scores. If if you're if there's a big match going on, you can get – it'll just automatically send you updates to your WhatsApp every time somebody scores in cricket or, or football, whatever the sport is you're watching. And it's something that in the U.S., just it, it would seem too primitive, but it's perfect for his markets. This is something that I see in a lot of folks that are starting to get into – you know, they've gone into maybe Japan or Canada, parts of Europe, and now they're, you know, interested in Latin America or Southeast Asia. They just, the WhatsApp phenomenon is brand new to them. And they, they, it takes them a while to catch on to exactly how huge this is outside the United States. But what yeah. are some other ways that f folks really ought to be paying attention to platforms like WhatsApp uh, that just, if you had that as the centerpiece of your strategy here, it just wouldn't make many, make much sense. Well, so actually, YouTube. I know that you know there's obviously a lot of advertising on YouTube, and people recognize YouTube as a big, a big market. But actually, YouTube outside of the U.S. is is huge. I think in the U.S. again. So one of the central things we learned very early on is that pay close attention to to data. And on the, in this case, I mean, we care about data, both in terms of decision making, how data informs your decisions, but this case, access to data, people's ability to, to have access to cellular data plans. And then understand in each market where you're investing or looking, how people are going, how people are consuming data, are they doing on a prepaid plans? Are they, are they get, are they able to buy, you know, all you can eat data plans? Do they choke the data if people get to a certain level of consumption? I mean, how the phone operators deliver data is really important. We actually invested one of our first technology companies is a company called Datami, D-A-T-A-M-I. And Datami uh, writes, produces a software that allows phone operators to sell so-called zero rated data. So they sell technology that allows a phone operator to deliver content to somebody who can't afford data and the bill for the data gets billed to either the content producer or to an advertiser or to the phone operator, <coughs> the phone operator is trying to distribute that content. Um, that actually has become a very successful investment in part because not only are content companies using it, but actually e-commerce, ride hailing companies, people who, financial services who want people to have access to their product with their mobile phone all the time, even if they don't have a data plan, those companies are now paying for the data. So that's an interesting, an interesting development. Um, but, you know, so I lost my train of thought in terms of your, your last question. Uh, well, it led to another one. Uh, what are some other Please. interesting ways that um, companies are, uh, media companies are accessing 
consumers in these markets. Things like data me, but also uh, innovative ways of using social media, things that uh, perhaps brands should understand uh, as they enter into these markets. Well, I think a lot of the perceived restrictions on use of information that you will encounter, particularly in Europe, but also increasingly in the US, don't apply in these markets. People are willing to give you a lot of access to their information in exchange for um, for offers. So there's a, in, for example, in, in Southeast Asia, which is a very fast growing um, internet region, I think it's, the, they say the internet base in Southeast Asia is now at 260 million people and they think it'll be 480 million by 2020. So it's you know gonna double in the next few years. And in those markets, people respond incredibly fast and favorably to advertisements that are geo-targeted. So if if somebody sends them a note, if, you know, I'm making this up, but if Procter & Gamble knows that you're in a certain place and says, hey, you can go and buy this Procter & Gamble product right nearby for this discount, they get very good response. And in a lot of these markets, I think it's partly because people haven't been inundated with advertising before um, and they're it's all new. It may not last. I mean, I think in the end, everybody sort of gets equally weary of being besieged by advertising. But at the beginning, actually, those advertisements, particularly the geo-targeted ones, the ones that seem to really serve people's interest, they resonate. They connect. Um, we Again, we, we have investments in Southeast Asia, um, Philippines, Indonesia. You know, Indonesia, we're investors in a company called IDN Media. IDN. And uh, IDN Media does... Again, I hate to analogize to U.S. companies, but for ease of understanding, they do a lot of sort of Refinery29 content that's aimed at women, um, young women, relationship, beauty, advice like that. And advertising in that platform works incredibly well and incredibly fast. Deep conviction on the part of users that what they're getting from that provider is something they need to care about. Um, so I think that's that's a sort of important lesson for for brands is that actually the advertising can work you know it has to fit with with within what people expect in that community or fit within whatever that brand whatever that media platform is but it can work very well do you find them integrating much with some of the marketing tech that it, you know marketers in the united states or europe or japan or other parts would be fairly accustomed to using for example what kind of marketing tech I mean, everything from the ad networks to uh, ah, even yeah. HubSpot or, you know, any of any of these kinds of things where there's all kinds of add ons and plugins. Uh, well, it's certainly happening, you know, in in regional centers like Singapore for Southeast Asia. Yeah, they're bringing all that stuff into each market. You know, network ads, um, I think it's a kind of a global phenomenon. It it very it, it, it's easy. To, they're easy to build out and um, easy source of revenue for people and. I think invariably that'll be a sort of a, a source of revenue in almost all these startup digital economies. I do think there's a lot of interesting stuff around um, what we would call sponsored content or content that's uh, tailored for advertisers by the content company themselves. So back to Pocket Aces, the company that we invested in Mumbai, you know, they integrate marketers messages into these sitcom like videos which do incredibly well then they're they're subtle about it it's every bit as good as the kind of integration you'd get out of hollywood in a in a television production in hollywood if you got them to integrate your product into their show um and they know that that's much more valuable to the advertiser and much more effective with the consumer than just sort of a you know yelling and screaming kind of ad that might appear or you know a small network ad display at the bottom of a web page. And by the way, I think web pages, you know, the notion of the web page, and I, we know this in, from, from our market here, you know, there's still visitors to destination web pages, but I think most content in most places increasingly is distributed content. So you're catching people for a period of time or you're catching people on a specific platform. I, you know, I was going to go back to, let me go back to YouTube for a second as we were talking about YouTube. And I, I think I was saying before that YouTube is incredibly powerful uh, outside of the U.S. And in the Middle East, for example, some of the some of the markets that have the highest per capita usage 
of YouTube in the world are in the Middle East. And a lot of that content is actually not produced in Arabic. In fact, Google, Google estimates that only 0.9% or this is a, it may be an 18 month old statistic, so I could be off slide, but it, about 0.9% of the digital content in the universe of digital content is Arabic. Yet the population of the world who were born speaking Arabic is about 7%. So just to normalize that, there should be this incredible growth in Arabic content. But for a whole lot of reasons, some of them political, um, there hasn't been, you know, a huge organic boom in Arabic content yet. And so people watch, so in Arabic speaking markets, people consume a lot of content wherever they can get it. And there's, they're looking for, they look for dubbed content, obviously. Um, but YouTube has done incredibly well in those markets. And I think, you know, the challenge on YouTube in international markets as in the U S for, for marketers is brand safety. Um, you know, can, how do you ensure that your advertising is in the right place? But that's, it's a platform that people care a lot about. We actually, one of our, you know, if I may continue with sort of my describing investments that we do, we, one of our investments, which has become very successful in the last year, it's a New York based technology company called open slate and open slate produce produces slate scores, which rank digital video channels according to brand safety and context so that advertisers can know when they're putting an ad up that they're not going to hear opposite content that they don't like. And open slate has seen again, huge, de huge demand for their product outside of the U S because this problem is the same in other markets, but maybe more difficult because, you know, advertisers maybe have even less visibility into the markets where they're, where they're trying to reach consumers. Um, and I think this is, you know, the ability of advertisers to connect with these very large, very media hungry new consumers in these markets is going to be complicated by understanding how they consume content and what content they're consuming and ensuring that, you know, the messages are being delivered in the right environments. So what is your summary of that? What are they consuming and <laughs> uh, what would be some keys to reading this, right? So you, you're, you're a marketer from the United States. You've got a cool, hot brand that obviously you're getting signals from that region that people care about and you want to go all in um, or you're a tech platform uh, that, that would be doing something similar. How do you read that landscape and really determine uh, what you, where you should be focusing? Well, I think this is part of the argument for talking to the media companies that are regionally or nationally based, because they're going to have a better understanding of their market in general. I mean, I don't think, you know, you probably don't want to just go to one and expect them to have all the answers, but I think talking to them about that market is, I mean, it's, I don't think it's convenient, by the way. I don't think it, it would be nice if there was sort of a single international market and you could put in, you know, you could deliver an ad to a single international market. It would work for everybody. And there probably are some brand ads that work like that. And there's some brands that, you know, work. I remember, again, to just date myself back when we published the Asian Wall Street Journal in Asia. And I was working out there in the 1980s and 90s. You know, car advertisers wouldn't advertise. And the reason was we would print the same edition that would go to places where they drove on the left, like Singapore, as places where they drove on the right, like Taiwan. And the advertisers actually don't want it. They, they're a little, it's a little They may not offer the same car in, the, in different markets, but they also had issues like with the visuals. Like, and there, there, that problem has actually never been easier to get around because you can deliver advertising not only to each national market but to each regional market. You can deliver advertising tailored to a specific demographic. Um, but understanding the sort of the flavor and nature of that content, I think it really using the local media companies to understand that is going to be important because they do, you know, the ones that are, if, if I were an advertiser and I'm most definitely not an advertiser, uh, never have worked in that business. But if I were an advertiser looking at going into, you know, international, big international markets, you know, I would spend a lot of time talking to the people who run the successful digital media companies in those markets and understanding what's working. I try to find the people who are really, you know, figuring out new things. So ex example in Mexico, which I think is one of the most promising from a media growth point of view, one of the most promising markets right now in the world, because it, it comes from a place where there was a long time, you know, television oligopoly and, you know, mobile phone monopoly now oligopoly. And all those things are, are, you know, being broken up. There's now multiple television channels available digitally. There's four phone operators offering competitive plans, but 
the, and there's 60 million people under the age of 30. It's a huge potential market, and it's incredibly still dispersed. There's there's very little people. There are very few products that have started to really accumulate scale. So we invested in a company that publishes something called Pictoline, P-I-C-T-O-L-I-N-E. Pictoline are short, visual, shareable, news-related content pieces that they're pub- he publishes you know, up to half a dozen or so a day. And each one of them will get widely shared. They're, they're clever. They have attitude. They're drawn by a team of artists who've all been trained by their sort of senior artists to like draw in the style of Pictoline. They get incredibly widely shared. And he's, and the guy who, who started the company, who's brilliant on, on digital media, Gustavo Guzman, he restricts how many advertise, how many sponsored picto lines he will put. I think he only does like two a week or something because he doesn't want to inundate his audience. And he won't, the advertiser, he, if you want to advertise with him, he will, you know, he makes it and he works with the companies to make sure it works for them. But he's not going to put anything out that his audience won't like. So if he can get, you know, five million shares with a standard picto line, he wants to get five million shares with an advertiser's picto line. He's he's very concerned about that. And he actually his business, it's a small team, but it's profitable. And this is a guy who has an incredibly astute, almost intuitive understanding of the media market in that country. He he also happens to own the the sort of New York magazine in Mexico City, which is of course a big city and an interesting magazine, and he owns a free daily newspaper. And he's he's totally in tune with what young people in that country are interested in. And he works with and the advertisers in Mexico all know him because he owns a sports marketing company too, and they've figured out that this guy has a sense of what the audience wants. And again, I I can't tell you that there's nobody in big international media who understands Mexico. I I wouldn't want to you know speculate and criticize by implication anybody, but I do know that if you really wanted a fast read on that market, this is the guy you would talk to. Mm-hmm. Spoken like a true journalist, if you want to get the straight deal, you got to go to the folks who are there and talk to them about it. Right. Um, so one last thing that I'm curious about here is, uh, is about income levels um, mm-hmm. and consumption habits at each level of the pyramid. You've got the wealthy, you know, upper middle class, middle, middle, lower middle, and then poor. Um, poor seems to be shrinking around the world. Uh, and, and that means that folks are entering the lower middle income, uh, space. And what do you see from those folks? Uh, and, and how, how much interest and vitality and energy is going on at each of those levels? So I would say in most places, the first wave of media in one of these markets where people are sort of getting access to broadband and technology, mobile technology for the first time, the first wave is going to be serving the upper income users, obviously. First of all, they get phones first. They get data plans with their phones. They travel internationally. They see what else is out there. So the the first products tend to serve them and their consumers, by the way. They're not, they're, it's easy to build, easier to build a business around somebody who's actually going to um, engage with your advertiser's products or in case, I think there will be increasingly num- increasingly large numbers of companies that decide to go for subscription products in some way, and those are obviously aimed at the higher tiers. Now, the, now what's happening in most most big emerging markets is people are serving the, the middle market, and the middle market is data is sensitive to the price of data from cell phone operators, so they don't want mobile. They, you know, they're not looking for products that are going to suck up their data plan. If or if they do have, if you know, they're interested in using their mobile phone but not having to drain data. So people build products, for example, in a lot of, in a lot of these big growth markets um, that allow people to download content that they can take with them on their commute without having to pay for access to data. And so that's the sort of second tier. Then the bottom tier, actually, I haven't seen a lot of media companies that are specifically serving that tier. I think the, those, those people who are the last to get mobile phones, they, get, they start off with feature phones, which is the old traditional sort of very non- smartphones and there's still you know a billion people in the world who are running around with feature phones and can't afford uh barely can afford the data for their feature phone they can't afford to go to a smartphone um that number is going to recede but that's still a huge market um we've seen some interesting technology companies come through which are finding solutions that will offer you know free wi-fi access at a small like neighborhood bodega or tea shop or where people in whatever community may go 
so that they can go there and like buy a ticket for data and just you know get Wi-Fi access. I don't see, and I think there are people who will be delivering some kind of information and media to those audiences and probably connected with the fact that you know you're in a place where you just bought something you just bought access to data so maybe when you buy access to data you hit a landing page before you get access to data that says hey here's a coupon to buy you know this soup that's down aisle three and i think there's going to be opportunities around that too because even the lowest income consumers with phones are in fact consumers and they buy things um, but I don't think, you know, that's not where we're focusing our energy. Cause I think it's a, if we saw something there, we might go, we might be interested in working with them, but it's, we're sort of the, I would say we're more focused on the middle income and to some degree upper income markets in these growth markets. Got it. Um, one last question. I know that that was technically my, my last one that I was thinking of, but also, um, what are some of the challenges that you've been facing or, or some of the uh, growing pains or, you know, things that you've needed to figure out that you might not have expected? So we invest uh, about 60 percent of our investments are in media companies that serve these growth markets. And about 40 percent are in technology companies that have applications for media in these growth markets. We have strayed a little bit from our mandate. And when we strayed, it's sometimes not worked out great. Um, we get tempted by, you know, on a couple of occasions, media companies that have sort of anchors in the U.S. And we think, oh, we'll help them get outside of the U.S. And what we've learned is that, in fact, as I said earlier, that the U.S. market is a very hard market to succeed in. And, you know, it's you can get a lot faster, bigger growth in a lot of the growth markets where we are active. Um, we have found that technology investments, the media investments in the U.S., you would generally assume a media investment takes a bit longer to gestate than a technology investment. Technology investments tend to get acquired if they're successful technologies or tools or software. There's generally somebody who would like to acquire them. But actually, we're finding that the the media companies in these growth markets, because they grow so fast, if you catch the sort of the demand curve at the right place, um, that actually their their growth in terms of valuations has is, is been faster for us. So that's sort of a technical, maybe venture capital challenge. There's some political challenges, um, you know, being foreign investors in media internationally can create complications. Uh, there have been one of our early investments, which we made um, in conjunction with one of our big investors, was in a terrific company in the Philippines called Rappler, which was uh, became and is probably still the biggest digital media company in in Philippines and maybe in Southeast Asia. It was number 10 in the Alexa rankings in the Philippines. Um, and they did. They do a lot of journalism. They do a lot of lifestyle and other kinds of coverage too. But their journalism got them crossways with the government, and there was an investigation into the way one of the other investors had invested in the company. And it, they concluded the government concluded that it had violated the constitution. And you know, there's been this big kerfuffle in which um, the government has ordered their business registration revoked, but then suspended it temporarily, and now it's under appeal. And you know, there's a there's a fairly large political dimension to it. Um, not that the government doesn't have the right to review anything for legality, but I would say it's largely a political issue and largely focused on the nature of the coverage of the company. We, we tend to not want to get into places where the politics is going to be troublesome. I mean, I'm not, I'm not shy and I'm not afraid to be in a, in a country where government doesn't like somebody doing independent high quality journalism. I'm perfectly happy to defend that for as long as I'm um, breathing. But it is also the case that from an investment point of view, we're not we're not looking for investments that are going to just, you know, set us up in conflict with governments. But I think political risk is a real risk. And, you know, we're, we're ready for that. I think that political risk is vastly outweighed in our, in our portfolio and in the countries where we're investing by the desire of the populations in these countries to have access to good information. And we invest in things like sports media. One of our investments, 90 Min or Minute Media, is one of the fastest growing digital sports companies in the world. We invest in business information. We have a company called Asoko Insight that does business information for people in Africa. If you're a banker or investor in Africa, you would use Asoko for its data. Um, we invest in tools. We have a company that does data analytics for media companies called Content Insights, and Piano is another company we invest in that does all the content monetization software for 
content companies, and by the way, increasingly for advertisers too. And so we're we're looking at we look at the sort of media environment holistically, and you know, if there is a if there's a challenge beyond this sort of standard issue business challenges, I think politics is probably the one thing in in this kind of international investing you have to be a little bit wary of. Mm. Um, fake news, closing comment on that. Um, I think fake news, you know, it's so broad now and to everybody uses it to mean something else. I would say, I, I think so the not, not media, the Donald Trump or, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, what, what leaders would oh, use to, mean, to deflect. <laughs> you don't mean what the failing New York times is publishing. Correct. Um, right. No, this would be, uh, foreign I, produced or domestically produced with the intention of either just you know, just sheer commercial interest or political interest. Uh, I think I think Facebook and Twitter, prominently in this country, have an enormous responsibility that they've basically run away from and and shirked to try to to control the flow of information, um, the nature of information that goes to people. I know Facebook is very concerned, as I suppose Twitter is about not being described as a media company, which has a lot of legal implications, but, you know, try as they might, they are not going to escape that designation. I think there, there's a little naivete or a little bit of um, sort of wishful thinking going on. They, they're going to have to make some choices about what content gets shared and distributed. It's, it's not only, um, I think it's not, not only going to be inevitable from a regulatory point of view, whether the U.S. imposes regulations or the Europeans, as the Germans have already done, start to impose restrictions or requirements on them to to monitor and pay attention to the quality of the content. Um, it's also there, there's a sort of moral and political dimension. The pressure is is real. I mean, I to go back to the Philippines, for example, there was a long cover article about how in the Philippines people have used social media, in particular Facebook, to pursue to promote fake news, to pursue vendettas, including against the founder of Rappler, the company which we're invested in the Philippines. And, you know, it it really is outrageous that the company, that Facebook hasn't done more to try to take on these problems directly because, you know, it'd be tough to be in a, to be a company that operates in 100 plus markets with a billion plus users or 2 billion users. I don't know what they're, what they're at now, but, I think it comes with the territory and you know a lot of these things are more solvable than the companies want to let on because in order to solve them they have to take on responsibility and taking on responsibility they may they're, they're probably concerned about taking on legal liability as well but I, I i feel quite strongly that um anybody who redistributes fake news um threats other forms of political or online thuggery, I think needs to be reviewing how it manages itself and what it, how it sees itself and trying to find solutions to curb that behavior. So fake news is something that I think we'll be taking up uh, later this year. So hope you'll join us for that because a um, few of the folks in our network uh, have dealt with reputation management for a variety of uh, companies and and this is just such a huge issue these days that I think it's really something that needs to be uh, understood and thought through uh, because I, th I think you're right you know if if Facebook and Twitter and some of the other ones expect to keep going like this I think they're gonna they're gonna face regulation so I, I don't think that they have much choice uh, one way or the other and they're just gonna have to pick the least bad option for them uh, which hopefully is the best option for the rest of us I'm sure that's right. I think you're exactly right. But that's an episode for another day. And we've taken plenty of your time. Thank you so much for sure. uh, joining us on this and lending some of your insight. Um, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you for your time. And I look forward to talking again soon. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to find out more about our events and get more global intel every week, sign up for our newsletter at getglobal.co.